Hello and welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Awaza, makers of fine filtration products like the Biomaster canister filter and BioPlus internal filters. Let's talk about the Biomaster for a moment here. With its removable pre-filter cleaning system, integrated heater option, and ultra whisper quiet technology, what is not to love about this filter? If you're in the market for a new canister filter, you owe it to yourself and your fish to check out the Awaza Biomaster canister filter. Use the links in the show notes and check out these great products. Now, on to the interview. Today's date is Wednesday, November 6th, 2019. My guest today is Dr. Anthony Maserol. Anthony is a professor of biology at Soka University in Southern California. Anthony is also a co-founder and executive director of the Amazon Research Center for Ornamental Fishes in Iquitos, Peru. Anthony's traveled the world in the name of ichthyology and has shared his passion and experiences with numerous fish clubs. So, Anthony, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much again. Yeah, welcome to the podcast a second time. <laughs> so, for the uh, for the context for the listeners, Anthony, you were casualty number one of the recording malfunction, the recording uh, fiasco that happened from the uh, from the recent collecting trip that I went on to Peru. Um, so you and I, we had a, a fantastic interview. Neil Clark, who I actually had on a couple episodes ago, he was standing there uh, live in person, not as a, a participant, but Neil was there, listened to the entire conversation. He thought it was great. You and I, we, we both thought we had a great conversation. Um, you know, having never yeah ha having having an interview like right there in your uh, in the research center was really really awesome and then I get back and I listen to it and you know 10 seconds in every 10 seconds there was garbled audio because of um, what whatever happened I don't know this was like really expensive uh, kind of in the field interview recording lapel mics and software so good times they or maybe won't, they won't yeah, be getting a recommendation it could be my guard <laughs> Well, you said that's what did it. Oh, nice! Your garbled voice, good times. All right. Well, hopefully we're both uh, we're both in our respective homes. Uh, we're using Skype, so hopefully Skype doesn't let us down and we get some good recording. So, how have you been, man? You've been uh, you've been pretty active. How was aquatic experience? Uh, aquatic experience was very nice. It was the first time that I'd ever been there. I was supposed to go last year, and something came up at the last minute, so uh, we weren't able to go. So we we went this year. It there was a lot of people. Uh, I've been to a few shows that that same group puts on, but in Southern California, and they tend to be much, much smaller. Oh, and, really? and so we, yeah, we had a lot of people come to our booth and talk to us. Oh, that's so awesome. Very good, yes. So uh, you've been to, uh, I'm, I'm guessing, what is it, America's Family Pet Expo in Southern California? So that's held every year in April at the Orange County Fair in Costa Mesa. Oh, I thought that that was bigger than Aquatic Experience, but that's kind of cool to hear that uh, AE was bigger. Uh, it's well, it's a bigger show in general because they have all sorts of animals. Uh, but in terms of the aquatic exhibition, Aquatic Experience is by far the biggest. Oh, gotcha. Okay, and and I guess kind of the interest, right? So people. Um, it's kind of families. There's a whole bunch of YouTubers there. There's people for an aquascaping competition. So how many people would you say you think you talked to over the uh, course of the weekend? Uh, let's see. We, we probably talked to a good 500 people. Nice. Yeah. In which about 200, 200 of them gave us their email so we can keep in contact with them, uh, to let them know what's going on with the research center in the future. Oh, that's fantastic. So all in all, you're happy you guys made the cross-country trip to go? It's very happy. Oh, excellent. This was a great experience for us. Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I saw your pictures on Facebook, and it looked like you guys had a full-on booth and pamphlets and all. Like, you you know, you had a full production for being at a show. It wasn't just, you know, uh, a sticker and a, and a lollipop or anything, you know, at a, at a table. You guys had a lot of stuff you brought with you. Ate out candy, not lollipops, but candy. Oh, you did end up getting nice. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, how you bring them over. This eh? is we got true. Candy this is this is true. This is very very true. And then upcoming, you're you're traveling to to China to Shanghai in less than is it less than two weeks? Yes, and uh, it'll be a week from Sunday. I leave on the seventeenth of November. Okay, so, uh, for sip. So you leave a day before Corey and I leave. Yeah, okay. probably. Okay, for the uh, what is it like a. 16 hour flight 12 hour flight uh i fly into Shang uh to beijing first then into shanghai so total 
it'll probably be about 18 hours, 19 hours, because I have a two or three hour layover in Beijing. Oh, okay. Yeah, we got lucky. Apparently, there's a, there's a direct flight from Seattle to Shanghai, so... We yep. just get that one flight. That's that's kind of nice. You should have you should have came up here to Seattle again. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> how was your uh, how was your talk at the uh, the GSAS Greater Seattle Aquarium Society? It was very nice. It's a talk that I haven't done in a few years. It was uh, a talk on some work I was doing in Cambodia. I haven't been to Cambodia in about four or five years, uh, but I was working on uh, invasive species, primarily tilapia in the aquatic environments there in Cambodia. And so it, it was really a, a, I don't want to say a travel log, but it was more of a, a look at all the fishes that you could see in Cambodia that some you see in the hobby, some you don't. Yeah, uh, It's it's a, an area, a country where, even though it's right next to Thailand, it does have its own species that you don't find in Thailand. So it, it, uh, I love going there. It's, it's a beautiful place. And so what's the story with the invasive tilapia? Is it just kind of the standard they were introduced as a food fish um, yeah. and gone out of control? Yeah, heavily aquacultured there. Um, in Cambodia, about 80 to 90 percent of all their protein that they consume comes from fish and seafood. Mm. So aquaculture is really, really big there. And tilapia is one of the easiest things to raise. Uh, and so you find huge farms with tilapia and when the water floods of course the tilapia escape into the into the str streams and the rivers and so they're they're all over the place yeah it's uh it won't be this podcast i'm not going to subject you to it but i think i need to find somebody maybe if you have a recommendation of who you know a person and i we can just deep dive and talk about the history of tilapia aquaculture how is it that you know the tilapia species was identified and just kind of what those early roots are and then you know maybe some of the the larger cases of oh yeah this is where like the hurricane andrew story basically of the tilapia yeah. is escaping all over the world you know but we like, have them um, in california they were brought to california primarily to control hydrilla populations and instead of eating the hydrilla they ended up eating the desert pupfish which is oh, now oh nice yeah wild yeah jeez good times yeah we uh we like to we like to think that we can use nature to fight nature but yeah i don't know are, are cool. there I, I guess it would be good to hear of some success stories because i feel like we've got these really bad examples of like when it when it goes south like we introduce a toad to combat a bug or whatever it is and it like whatever yeah. whatever the story is but you know maybe if somebody could out there raise their hand and be like hey this is actually when we did a good job and we actually did do no, a good thing i know only one story where they brought in an exotic to control an exotic, and that was in, oh, I don't remember the country, but it's where they have a lot of invasive water hyacinths. I think it's Africa, uh -huh. uh, Africa, where, you know, water hyacinths from South America. It's been, you know, transplanted all over the, the world, mm -hmm. and they had major problems in a lake, and so they brought in a little weevil that only eats water hyacinths. And it eats the emerging leaves uh, when the water hyacinth starts to grow. And so once it eats those emerging leaves, the water hyacinth just falls apart mm. and dies. And so they were able to control the water hyacinth using these natural pests that were found in South America. Interesting. Interesting. And then that, that, that pest didn't go off and spread. And... That oh. and that's the problem. You bring in an exotic to control an exotic, you don't know what it's going to do in your native yeah. environment. Yeah. Uh, maybe I've got a, uh, I've got a silly one. How about if anywhere had a water lettuce explosion, right? Like they, they just need to get this yeah. invasive water lettuce down. You introduce manatees and I guarantee you, like, and if the manatee, the population explodes, I don't think anybody would be mad. Exactly. <laughs> They'd be like, we now have manatees. This is awesome. Yeah, you have a, you know, a nice, uh, tourist attraction. Exactly. That would be, that'd be such a win-win if you could like yeah. get invasive manatees to control your like invasive water lettuce population. That would be uh, that, that would be, that would be something for sure. All right. Enough about Randy's, uh, half baked ideas of how we can combat nature with nature. So Anthony, what is your, uh, you know, your, your Dr. Anthony Maserol, you are a professor at Soka university. You are a co-founder and executive director of the Amazon research center for ornamental fish. I mean, how, take it back to the beginning for me. How, how did you get started in tropical fish and, and ichthyology? Uh, it started, 
a long, long time ago. In a galaxy. Uh, say <laughs> nine years old. I've been in the hobby for about 51 years. Uh, maybe longer. I, you know, I, I'm getting old. I can't remember that far back. But my father was an elementary school teacher. Um, one, of, one of the teachers asked him if he would take care of his guppy tank over the summer because the teacher was leaving out of the country for all summer long. And so my dad brought home this guppy tank, um, and I was just fascinated by those guppies. Um, I was fascinated by the guppies. Uh, I was fascinated by the gravel, and the gravel always moved. It, I, it, I couldn't believe that rocks could move like that, that aquarium gravel could move like that. Little did I know, there was probably in a 10-gallon tank, probably 10,000 Malaysian trumpet snails in there. <laughs> nice. And that's what the gravel was. It wasn't gravel. It was just Malaysian trumpet snails wow. going after it. And, you know, at that point, I realized I, I don't like MTSs. I don't like Malaysian trumpet snails that much. They just cause too many problems. Nice. And, and so that that actually just made me very aware of fish in general. Uh, I grew up in Southern California in the desert, so water wasn't too plentiful. Uh, and so the whole aquatic environment really mesmerized me. And from then, it just blossomed into doing what I'm doing now. I never thought I would be a college professor. When I was, as an undergraduate student, never even imagined. I always thought I wanted to own a pet store. You know, like every kid who wants to own a pet store. Oh, yeah. Well, the first time I worked in a fish store, I realized, uh, you know, this interaction with customers, <laughs> I, I really don't appreciate that. You know, people say you own your own business. You could be your own boss. No, that's 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 not how it works. Your customers are your bosses. You know, and most of the time you have to. You know, they're right, even though they're wrong. You don't want to tell them they're wrong so strongly that they'll never come back. And my personality, I tend not to. I'm, you know, I'm not shy about telling people when they're wrong. I guess that is the reason I'm a college professor. <laughs> the the customer is sometimes always right. Customer is sometimes always right. Exactly. Nice. What would you say? So let's kind of fill in. Uh, let's fill in some details for me in your in your origin story. Um, what kind of fish would you say? So you're captivated by guppies, and again, folks, there's another. You know, somebody gets their start in the hobby with guppies. Uh, you know, it's again a fish that we it, just for the longest time, and myself included, we just you know we kind of look down on the guppy. We we're like, ah, that's not for me. I want something more exotic or this or that. But you know, one more example of somebody who is just at a very young age being captivated, enthralled, and you know that's kind of the gateway into the hobby and, and being a lifelong hobbyist and becoming an ichthyology professor. Um, so there, score score another win for the guppies. Good job. Uh, but after that, like, what would you say? You know, your fish keeping preferences, like did you find yourself a Corydora guy, an African cichlid, a live bear, um, anabatoids? Like, I found myself to be a cichlid person. Um, you know, in high school, I kept angelfish, um, bred angelfish, never did anything with them because we didn't have the big hobby industry where I was at. Um, and then I, the, I really fell in love with discus. Uh, I was probably 16 years old, saw a brown discus in a pet store and just really fell in love with that fish. And so from that point on, I kept discus pretty much nonstop. Um, and if you look at all our literature, our, the discus is our logo. Mm. So it's something always kept with me. It's the logo of this podcast. Oh, okay, and it, that's and right. It, and it took me it, it took me long <laughs> enough. Uh, this is the first episode yes. where I've actually got video with a guest, so there's there's the logo right there. Anthony gets to see that. Um, so the fish room now finally, uh, I, I so the fish room's been up and running. My fish room for maybe two years, and I would eh, maybe a year and a half. I don't know how long it's been, but um, I would say it's it's kind of taken this progression where it's almost in line with uh, you know somebody going into college as being undeclared. Mm -hmm. Like they think yeah. they think they may know what they want to major in. They think they want to know what they want to do when they grow up, when they get out of college. 
Um, and they kind of go through some courses and then all of a sudden they, they find their stride. They find like the real passion. And I think for me, it's discus is what was going to get me into the hobby. Discus is what I was planning my first tank to be. And then I kind of got sidetracked a little bit and went down the rainbow fish path and then some other kind of fish species built the fish room and, you know, bought some exotic guppies and, and, uh, angel fish and whatnot. But now, um, you know, I've got, I've got, uh, I brought back 10 of the, uh, Peruvian discus. Unfortunately, the biggest one, one of the biggest ones ended up, uh, like it, it just didn't write itself when we, when I got it back and stayed on its side for a really long time, tried to lower the water level to keep the pressure down to hopefully it would write itself. And it just, it didn't make it. And then like one day it, it looked like it was going to make it and it was swimming. And then it just succumbed to, it just succumbed. So I've got nine wild Peruvian discus. And then I picked up, um, a, a designer, a designer, you know, man-made discus, if you will. And so the fish room, I, it's going to turn into a, you know, primarily, um, discus growing facility for the most part. And I think that's the fish that both myself and what I sold my wife on when I told her I was going to get a 75 gallon tank, you know, upgrading from a two gallon beta tank to a 75 gallon. I sold her on discus and how beautiful they were. And so now for me, the fish room, um, it's going to have that. And hopefully the next time you come up to Seattle, maybe it's a year down the road, I'll actually have some, some grow out tanks and a bunch of discus and whatnot. So that's fingers crossed. I'm having success with some angels that I still had. But nonetheless, like that's, that's kind of, that's in my head, how I've internalized it and how I want to communicate it to people that this fish room in a very short time has just kind of gone through a few iterations on what it's going to be. And now I think for the foreseeable future, it is going to be a discus fish room. Well, it's addicting. I have a 500 gallon corner tank that I built myself that for the most part is filled with wild discus from Peru as well. Oh, that's awesome. You'll have to share, uh, share a picture or a video of that with me. Yeah, it's, it's you know, a bunch of red spotted greens. Mm, and so from a, so then from the academic standpoint, then when you went into undergrad, did you, were you already dedicated to biology and ichthyology? Uh, yeah, I was dedicated. I wanted in my high school yearbook, it, you know, they have the write ups of what do you want to be? You know, I, I said, I wanted to be a marine biologist. Mm. I had no idea how to get there. Uh, and so I went to UC Santa Barbara and got an undergraduate degree in aquatic biology. Uh, and so, you know, from there, went to a master's degree uh, in my Ph.D. My Ph.D. work was on um, migration patterns of coral reef fishes in the Red Sea. And so for many years, I, I actually worked in the Red Sea uh, for my research. And so, the you know, I've always had freshwater fish. I don't keep marine fish at all, uh, primarily because I, I I really like to see the hobby, all the hobby go into captive breeding of fishes, um, and so there's so many marine fishes that are still collected in the wild, uh, and so you know I, I applaud those um, those companies that are able to breed clownfish, they're able to breed some of the wrasses. And keep those fish in the hobby, and that, that's what I would like to see the hobby eventually totally turn into all captive bred. I feel like a, I feel like a previous guest. It might have been Shelby from Seagrass, but she might have. Maybe I asked her this, but what what ends up being so difficult with with saltwater fish um, to breed? It's it's not necessarily the breeding. It's that they spend a couple months in the larval column in the water column as tiny, tiny babies. Mm, so okay. culture, you have to be a, a fish food specialist. Rotifers, you have to be able to culture rotifers, culture phytoplankton, zooplankton. And so they're eating the tiniest foods. And that's, that's the stumbling block is trying to get foods that they will eat. Mm, and if okay. you immediately to eat um, powder food or some other prepared mix, then you you've won half the battle, but it's still a difficult endeavor to get it to that point. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I, I, I think maybe I remember that, but oh, well, if I don't, thank you for, yep. uh, for giving me that explanation again, that, uh, that makes oh, a right. lot of sense. And I think, uh, Preston John who's breeding the, the Shodanti puffer. I think the smallest food he has to get down to, 
I don't think it's nearly at that at that microscopic level like what the saltwater fish does, but that's a fish though that he's had tremendous success with that's very, very difficult. It's probably one of the more difficult freshwater fish to, to breed, um, but he's got like this, you know, if you go back and listen to the podcast of that episode, I mean, he's just got like this laundry list, detailed schedule of, you know, within, you know, within the first seven days, this is what I'm feeding. I have to feed seven times a day and it's something that you can't auto feed and it has to be live and this and that. And they're like tiny little, like whatever they are. And it, it's insane. And he's like, and if you miss one feeding, you'll die. Like the, you'll lose yeah. everybody. Like it's, it's absolutely insane. And then once you can get to them, you get them to a point where they can take like a, I don't know, maybe it's not a brine trim, but it's like they can take like a, a baby something that's fairly, fairly readily available. That's like 30 days into the endeavor. And it's like, oh, and, man, I can finally take a day off. And that's why most captive bred fishes, especially in the marine trade, they're still very expensive because it is labor intensive to get them over that critical period where they're eating the, the most minute foods that you have to constantly have in front of them. Or, you know, they will die because they're using lots of energy at that point, you know, putting on tissue rapidly, growing rapidly. And so if you miss a feeding, forget it. It's, it's you know, and if it's, if it's a food that doesn't have the essential um, nutrients for them, forget it. They're not going to survive at all. Hmm. Interesting. So it is, it's real science for those who are, who are breeding marine fishes. Yeah, that definitely, it really take, that definitely ever. sounds like it. That, that would, yeah, that sounds like you need your whole, like you need a dialed in lab and facility and yeah, I mean, you know, hats off to those that, that, you know, are, are able to do it and, and are having some success, but, uh, I don't know. Part of me is kind of biased. I just want everybody to keep fresh water anyway. Who, who wants, who wants the blue light and corals in your house? <laughs> I agree too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Like one of these days, I think I might have a clownfish tank or something, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We will see. So what are you going to be doing at SIPS? SIPS, I, um, I'm going to be judging uh, one of the competitions. And if you ask me what competition it is, I'm going to get very angry because I've forgotten. <laughs> what it, is. Uh, it may be the, uh, the biotype or the, you know, the aquascape okay. competition. I, I've judged that Aquarama in the past. So this is my first SIPS uh, show. But I'm also going to be uh, giving a lecture at the Shanghai Ocean University. Um, and so that's, that's the main reason. Well, that's, that's kind of the main reason I'm going there. That's how I was able to, to get the university to agree to let me go is because I, you know, I'm doing an academic talk as well. Mm -hmm. In your experience, how, how in tune are like, I don't know. Like, is the Chinese ichthyology conservationist? Like, is there a, is is there a decent number of of folks over in China that you know have a passion and concern for the environment? Because I feel like China gets a lot of bad press when it comes to kind of natural and you know animal and endangered animal issues. Like, I don't you know this is not a a podcast for for you know hot topics or anything, but. Um, you know, what, what, what is your take on that? Obviously you're going to go over there and, and talk to some ichthyologists or some people they, that are interested in you know, it. They've been studying fish forever, uh, to tell you the truth. You know, uh, the Chinese and, and the Japanese were the first aquaculturalists in, in some respects, especially when it comes to, to koi, mm -hmm. you know, koi part of, uh, Asia life for thousands of years. Uh, but there is a, a growing conservation effort in in China. Um, you know, with most countries, there's a battle between uh, conserving the environment and trying to have economic gains for your your country. Yep. Uh, you know, America, we we still have those same problems. Yep. You know, we're no different than even you know many of the developing world. Um, and so. There, there is a large group of, of conservation-minded scientists there. Uh, there's even um, environmental groups in China now um, that are they're trying to to save the environment, trying to clean up the environment. So it, there's more effort than there was, let's say, 20 years ago. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And uh, 
my time in Peru, you know, it's when you watch the videos, the, some of the videos I've put out, the videos that are on the, the co-op YouTube channel, like you see and, and other people like other travel vloggers and whatnot that are completely outside of the tropical fish space. But they go to Iquitos because it's a it's a jumping off point for Amazon expeditions. Um, you know, you see that the living like the 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 sanitation, the trash, like it's not it's not necessarily a standard that we are accustomed to. Um, and so you're immediately like, oh man, like this is really tragic. But some of the, the positive things that I can share out of that experience is that the younger people, the people that I interacted with at the Manatee Research Center, um, you know, uh, undergrad student, uh, an undergrad student girl from, uh, who actually was a, a Lima, uh, a Lima resident who was doing some work at the, uh, Manatee Research Center. And she was actually looking to go to UC Davis in California. I thought that was so cool. I'm like my sister went there. Like I, I used to live in Sacramento. That's so funny. Like super small world. Anyway, um, you know, there's this younger, the younger generation, uh, it really is conservation minded. They're very much like, man, we should probably not be throwing trash everywhere. And you know, the joke of throwing your styrofoam in the, in the, in the Amazon river and then saying, Oh, it's Brazil's problem now. Like, yeah. you know, I think, I think, you know, there's just like in, in, in education and in a, in a cultural shift and it's going to take time and it's a generational thing. Um, and I think I've equated it to, I don't know who I was talking to, but, um, that it's like that episode of Mad Men where they go and, you know, it's the 1950s, late fifties, whatever it is, the family has their picnic in the park and they get up and leave and they leave all their trash behind, you know? So it's not too long ago that even in America, we struggled with, Hey, if you're going to like drink a soda, don't throw it out of your window on the freeway. Like, throw yep. your own trash away. Like that's not something that we are incredibly, you know, it, we've been doing it for, for centuries. Like that's, that's a couple decades that we haven't been throwing our trash out of the car. And still I can drive down my country roads and find people that leave their, you know, old Maytag washer and mattresses on the side of the road. So we're not completely, you know, blameless ourselves. Yeah, ex exactly. You know, and, um, that's one thing we're trying to do at the research center is, is educate people, on all these issues, you know, and, and we're educating them through the Peruvians. Nothing worse than a foreigner coming in the country, no matter what country it is, and telling the people, you're wrong, you're doing everything wrong. It, the message is lost when, especially when Americans go into countries and say, you need to change your ways. Well, we have to look at our past, like you said, you know, I remember growing up, people threw all their trash outside out of the car as you drove and drove down the freeway, that was just commonplace. And so, you know, it takes time for people's attitudes to change. It, you know, it starts with the young kids. It really does. Mm -hmm. What is your, so let's, let's start with, uh, with this. What, what's your history with Peru? When's the first time you went there and, and on what terms, I guess? Oh, actually I had, um, the first time I went to Peru, I took a class of 12 students. Uh, to Peru to look at uh, sustainable development and sustainable breeding, or not breeding, but sustainable living in some of the villages. And that was in 2000 and I believe 2005, uh, January, no, May 2005. So at, that was my first introduction into Iquitos. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't a place I thought I'd ever go back to, but I wanted to go see the Amazon the Amazon basin itself. Uh, after that, I started working in Leticia, Colombia, which is downriver from Iquitos. It's uh, at the very southern tip of, of uh, Colombia. I was working on um, population genetics of discus. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any discus in Colombia. Uh, there are some, but they're in an area where it's not the best places for Americans, much less the Colombian yeah, kind. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say probably nobody yeah. unless you're running. You so know. <laughs> they still had the FARC revolution going on, mm, so yeah. they controlled the areas. And the, the Peruvian scientists didn't even like going there. They, you know, they very seldom. They even though they had a research station there, it was basically an abandoned research station that they would go to once in a while. Is it Leti uh, just to stop you, Leticia, it's yeah. like uh, Brazil, Colombia, and Peru kind of meet at Leticia, right? Okay, yes, cool, yeah. cool. It's an area they call the Tres Fronteras, the three frontiers, mm. because you have a Peruvian city, um, uh, Santa Rosa, then you have Leticia, Colombia, and then you have Tabatinga, Brazil. 
and you you walk to Cappuccino. There's no border crossing. You just walk across the sidewalk, and you're in Brazil. Wow. And, and so really no borders there. People live in either city. It doesn't really matter. Um, but at that point, about two years later, I decided to, to try my luck in Peru. I know Peru had discus because I'd, I'd had Peruvian discus. There was a company that used to sell uh, discus out of Peru. Uh, and so uh, I knew I could find discus in Peru. And so what I did is I contacted all the exporters in Peru and asked, hey, anybody willing to help me with my research? And luckily, uh, two exporters actually agreed to help me. Uh, unfortunately, one went out of business soon afterwards. And so I, I hooked up with some biologists at one of the exporters. Um, and so it was actually those two guys are the co-founders for the research center itself. Hmm. So we stayed in contact. We were, we were really good friends. And so along the way, we decided, hey, uh, there's some land for sale. How about let's buy the land and, and start a research center? Okay. And yeah. that was eight years ago and that's a that's a gentleman i met down there right uh carlos yes. yeah yeah okay carlos. yeah yep 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 i carlos actually was the general manager at stingray aquarium mm -hmm. which is now aqua trade aquarium the largest exporter there in iquitos uh and so we actually stole him from <laughs> uh them. we hired him away and the third uh gentleman is uh Fernando Ramos, who's actually finishing up his PhD in fish pathology. He's a fish veterinarian, but finishing up his PhD in fish pathology in Brazil right now. Oh, awesome. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, Carlos, that guy was was fantastic. Super nice guy. And I'm Very nice. I, I'm you know, just, uh, I don't want to complain about not having time. I mean, I kind of have time, I did, but I just haven't got around to editing the video, the footage. So there will be a dedicated video of the Amazon Research Center. And I need to hurry up and put it out before, like, you completely finish the Research Which, Center. Cause... Uh, <laughs> what you have on video is so far behind. The The dormitories are, are finished. The kitchen is finished. Yeah, your pictures uh, look awesome. And we're starting the, the aquarium the public aquarium that we're building on site, mm -hmm. the, the side walls or perimeter walls are all done now. Mm -hmm. We're putting it on the so hopefully within seven months that will be open to the public. So that's you know we're 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 moving rapidly as they say. That's awesome. Well, I I would like to think that before the seven months is up, I will have a video out. <laughs> at least okay. you giving me and uh, Neil a little tour around because I, I I mean it, it, unless you disagree I, th I think that'd be kind of nice for posterity right to kind of show like a certain point of the development of the research center yeah and then and then I'll just have to come down and film something else of it being uh, actually completed yeah I'm going you know I'll be there right after Christmas for two weeks and then I'll be going back in March Very and then nice. again from June all the way to through August so I you know, I spend as much time as I can down there. Yeah, yeah. I really wish that, um, you know, from this trip down there, like, apparently in Peru, if you want to go to Iquitos or all flights, uh, all international flights uh, terminate in Lima. Yes, right? that is. Right. And, that, and yeah. that's a relatively recent development that they put into place. Is that? Uh, yeah. About four or five years ago, I was able to fly Copa Airlines out of LAX. To Panama City, Panama, and then from Panama City, Panama, take Copa Airlines directly into Iquitos, and that was a two-hour flight from Panama. Yeah, because then you're shaving you're shaving a good what four hours off, probably total transit time. Off plus the time that you have to spend in the airport. Most of the time, the flights into Lima come in flying about midnight, mm -hmm. and the next flight to Iquitos is five o'clock in the morning. Yeah, Lima so you, Lima was five brutal. hours. I had a, I had a one hour layover and I barely made it. I will never do that again. I had no idea to get through customs and immigration and everything. The signage in that airport is terrible. Yeah. The, I mean, now that being said, that's like kind of that domestic part. Like when when like when you're doing the domestic Lima airport, but once you're in their international terminal, you're like, oh, this is nice. Like this is the face that they want international travelers to see. And yep. yeah, the domestic side of things was completely different. Um, but when you, when you don't realize there's gates on a floor below you, the sign is to get to those gates are non-existent. Their so signage is so bad. 
through seven. There's no gate through one through seven. Yeah, that 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 signage was not good. Um, that that's for certain. But that being said, you know the uh, the airlines, the airport, they got me where I needed to go safely. Got me back home, so I can't complain too much. You know, making pretty uh pretty crazy amount of travel within a short period of time. So you know, God bless the airlines and and, and keeping us safe. Air travel is amazing. I mean, we complain about it, but it's it's an amazing thing. Yeah, it is. All right. So okay. So then uh, we're in Peru now. We've got the Amazon. Oh well, I guess okay. So let's say uh, let, let's take a step back. When at what point did you decide the Amazon Research Center was was going to be a thing? Like, what was the epiphany? What was the you know were you, were you having pollo cilindario uh, over some rice? Was that <laughs> cilindro chicken? Yeah, no, it, it was it was an an evolving process. We we wanted to to do it. We didn't have the money to do it, um, and so what happened was. There is a homestead law in Peru that if you put a house on, on land, it becomes your land. And so we had a guy overnight build a house on part of our land. And we actually lost about a third of the acreage for the research center. And at that point, we decided we either walk away or we start doing something. And so we started first building a, a uh, fence around it. Um, it just, you know, a barbed wire fence just to say, okay, this is our land. And we built a little hut to say, okay, we, we, we now show use on the land. Um, and then we had to start trying to raise money to start putting buildings up. Um, and you know, we, we do a fair bit of fundraising. Um, we, you know, we, we, you know, like any small nonprofit, you know, you always can get more money, uh, but you know we're we're doing okay, and and so um, we decided that we need either finish it or walk away, and so my wife and I sat down and looked at life for us, see how life was going for us, and we decided you know what this is something we both believe in, and so uh, we you know we set aside some money to start all the buildings, and you know hopefully money will still come in where we can totally finish what we want to do. Because right now we only have one floor of the dorms. Eventually we want to have a second floor. Right now we have four, four dorm rooms. We want to have a total of eight dorm rooms to allow for larger classes, larger groups of people to stay there. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, so yeah. you know, that will be the future for us. Yeah. And you guys said you're a, you're an official 501 C, right? 501. Official 501, uh, 501 C. 3 C. Uh, not, uh, we have a board of directors. Um, you can go to our website, AmazonResearchCenter.org. I have to give you that plug, um, and you, you'll you'll see, you know, the the board of directors, what we do, what you know, what we're all about. Uh, it's you know, we're we do things by by the law. We're mm -hmm. not we're fly by night yeah. place that money and, and run away. You know, we. <laughs> You you'll, you can see what we're doing there to show where all the money's going to. Yeah, I get, I get, and none of us none of us here in the U.S. get paid. Uh, Carlos is the only employee right now that we're paying directly, um, and you know we we need someone to manage the facility when I'm not there. And so um, Carlos, you know that's if we he's the only person that we actually pay. Uh, the board directors aren't paid. I am not paid. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's something we all believe in. Yeah. And as far as, uh, links and whatnot, I'll make sure that I've got all those in the show notes and, um, no you know, I'm, I'm always looking for people to bring onto the podcast that are doing something that, you know, can, can, um, that I, I guess from a, let's, let's say, let's, let's frame it this way. So right now, like the main way people get noticed and whatnot, or, or get publicity is through YouTube and Typically, you know, there's YouTube algorithms and people talk about this. I hate going down this rabbit hole. I pretty much never go down this rabbit hole. But, um, you know, if you put out certain content, you know, and you only get a fraction of the people that would normally watch one of your videos, people tend not to make those kind of videos, right? And so if this is one of those things, or I try to look for those things that are going to be just a straight up interesting conversation, just a fish yep. nerd that I can talk with and have a great conversation that people on their drive to work or while they're doing their fish tank maintenance can listen to. And hey, if they sell a product, if they 
promote something, if there's a good cause behind it. Like I want people to know about it and I want people to click a link, go check it out, see what it's about for themselves. And if it's something that they want to get behind, either through, you know, purchasing a 3D printed mat and filter or like whatever it is, or donating to the Amazon Research Center, um, like that's 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 a huge part of my goal is to be able to to share this wonderful this knowledge through wonderful technology that we have for free. Um, and for people to check it out. And so I would love for people to, with the links in the show notes, um, check out the Amazon Research Center, see what it's all about. And if your heart's like, you know what, I love this hobby. I think what they're doing is great. And we'll get into more of like the nuts and bolts of, of what you guys are actually going to do. But, you know, feel free to donate. I've told Anthony two times I'm going to donate and I've been procrastinating. I absolutely am. When we get off this call, I'm going to, we're going to, well, when we, when we stop recording, we're going to talk details. All right. But you know, yeah. If you told that to my wife, she would be hounding you. Good. I, I need somebody to have me. I, I saw her you know, email she, in the pamphlet. And the treasurer. So she she's the one who keeps track of money. Yeah, I got to talk about it. I want to get a, uh, I think I think from a contribution level, I, I got to figure out how much I can donate to get the Aquarius Podcast trash can. The Aquarius Podcast uh, basura. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. We, we, you know, if you go to our Facebook site, um, we do have on it um, – the recent upload of of, of uh, what your donation would buy. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. So that's donation. You know, so we're we're actually in the public aquarium. We're we're going to have a donor wall. All right, so uh, it's get, so it's going to get real clicky the for big, the guests. I'm I'm looking something the, up right now. The bigger the donation, the bigger your name will be on that donor wall. We even Sweet. you know you will name uh, the aquarium podcast. Um, Ten thousand gallon aquarium. <laughs> you, know, you can pick the aquarium you want for a certain amount of money. Oh, that's great! All right, so let's uh, let, let's get into the real. Let, let's talk about the details of the uh, of the research center. So we've got. I'm I'm on the Facebook page right now. Again, there will be a link to this in the show notes. I'm looking at that post right now. I'm guessing this was a brochure that you guys handed out at AE Aquatic it, Experience. Uh, we had it at, uh, at the uh, Aquatic Experience. Okay. Uh, um, so we've got some donor levels, gold, silver, bronze. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, Anthony. Those are above my, those are above my pay level right now, but, hey but we know hey. that there are, but we know that there is Aquarius out there that are doing real well that will take care of you on those ones. I, you um, know, I'll tell you this much. We appreciate every donation. We've had people donate $5 to us, which, you know what? I, I, I I'm more than happy, more than thrilled when people do that because I know they're doing what they can. Mm -hmm. That's all you can ask people yeah. to do is, you know, they believe in what we're doing. $5 is that's $5 more than we had to begin with. Well, I can tell you and right so, now I'm, I'm getting in the honored category. So okay. honor, honored starts at 25 bucks. That's, I can make yeah. that happen for sure. I'm going to go above, I'm going to go above 25 bucks. I'm not going to tell people exactly what I'm going to give you, but you'll know, but I'm yes. going to go above 25. I will be honored. So I'm going to be that. And then let's talk about what your donation supports. So, um, unfortunately you don't have access to the dollar a gallon sale down there. <laughs> the, the, unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, and, and that, unfortunately not. So, you know, 75 gallon tank, 200 bucks, which, you know, yeah. Hobby, yeah. hobby is here like what just go to your local yeah. Akitos petco no uh, unfortunately you know Akitos, everything has to be shipped into Akitos. it's it, people don't know Akitos is the largest city in the world that you can't drive to mm -hmm. you can only fly to it or you can drive down to a couple rivers and take about a 20 24 hour boat ride through all these different river systems and it won't get you to Akitos. it'll get you to a city called Nauta, which is uh, south of Iquitos on the Nauta road. Uh, you were on the road because you the, the, the road you took out of the city to get to our facility, that's the Nauta road. And 75 kilometers south is the city of Nauta, and that's where they unload all the, all the, the big ships and they truck things up to mm -hmm. Iquitos. The other way is they, you enter into the mouth of the Amazon, and take that thousand mile trek up the Amazon on a on a boat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the uh, the exporters that that we were using, they you know they had a, a really significant number of their tanks that were cracked but fully siliconed over yep. and fixed. And you know that that like that's just an absolute like that's a huge fixed cost to to have to replace an aquarium in your operation. Like if you're you know if you're replacing a couple of aquariums a month, like that's going to put a dent in in your operating expenses. So and just 
the largest thickness of glass you can get in a Quito's is three eighths of an inch. Again, That's it. What is okay? So I'm 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 trying to visualize that. Is that like the thickness of a ten gallon of a twenty or what? Do you, what's... Ten gallon uh, probably quarter inch or less. So probably like a fifty five. The old fifty fives used to have three eighths to a half inch glass. Okay. Okay. Oh, you know, you can't build big tanks with three-eighths of an inch. And the smallest tanks we're going to have in the public aquarium are going to be six feet long, um, two feet high, and three feet wide. Are you guys going to build – are you building out the frames yourself, and then you're just going to take, you know, p- paned glass and, and do it like that? Or are you going to actually have – Only how they do it is they just – silicone glass together okay uh, you know and, and there's no frames to them you know but one that's one of the things i'm going to sips for um we have to find a big piece of uh acrylic mm. or 21 foot wide tank uh we have some estimates on that and i, I, I won't be a fr- you know, shy to say that's twenty thousand dollars just for that one sheet of plexi. Wow, that has to be shipped in for another seven thousand um, dollars. And but we, you know, we want to have a nice big tank mm-hmm. uh, as a centerpiece for the aquarium itself. Is is there any possibility of like a you know a shut down animal park that had a giant display aquarium or a big old you know goofy restaurant that had a massive tank that's no longer in operation? Like, is there any salvage opportunities? Uh, we we've looked and we can't find any. Okay, there is you know there are two public aquariums in Lima. They are primarily saltwater, you know, dolphinarium type uh, aquariums. Uh, but, you know, they're still in operation, and, and they actually imported all of their tanks from China, mm. um, you know, had them manufactured in China to and then shipped over. And that, you know, SIPs, that's one of the things I'm going to be looking at is, is it cheaper for, for you know, some, some company to make the tanks and ship them to us? Mm-hmm. Looked at it here in the U.S., uh, so I have estimates on how much it will cost to ship things from the U.S. And we'll see what, you know, what the Chinese manufacturers will do. Mm-hmm. And so the, the public aquarium, what uh, is it the goal to kind of have is only only local species that are found in the Peruvian Amazon in the public aquarium? Or do you think you would have other species, you know, outside of South America, outside of Peru? What's, what's your thought process? Our, our, our thought process is to just have local fishes there. Uh, the people, even though they rely on fish for to eat, they probably know five or six species. That's it. Uh, those are the fish that they eat. No other fish they're concerned with. And so we, we want to show them the fish that are in their local environments. Uh, personally, for my research as a scientist, I work on grommies and guppies in Iquitos. They are an invasive species. They're both invasive species in, in Iquitos, but most of the people think they're native fishes. And so we want to have, want to have displays to show, you know, what are not native fishes, the destruction they're doing, and, and to give them a whole educational process. You know, our goal is to reach the kids. Um, to, we're going to, you know, we're going to have the aquarium open to all the schools in the area to have days for them just to come up uh, and learn about environmental education. You know, that's important to us, important to me as an educator to, you know, it's not going to be money making. It's going to be an education facility. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to forget about Garamis. I want you to go back and talk about that. But uh, so as far as the, once we do the ribbon cutting on the Amazon research center, is this, is this a place that's going to be in operation, open to the public, open to research 365 days a year? Or do you think it will follow like a, an academic calendar of, you know, these are, these are the few, these are the quarters of the year that we're kind of, you know, people are living in the dorms. We've actually got active research going on. Like, what do you think it's going to be as far as scheduling and, and, and whatnot? It's going to be 365 days a year. Okay. Uh, whether it's local students doing their master's degrees or their undergraduate thesis uh, or scientists and students from around the world. 
uh, you know, our academic calendar in the U.S. is much different than the academic calendar they have in, in Peru. You know, they, they are off um, January, February, March. That's, that's their summer vacation you know, much different than our summer vacation. Mm -hmm. So it'll be open 365 days a year, probably 360, 364. We'll probably, <laughs> Christmas will be off. Sure, sure. But, you know, it, it's something that it's going to be open all the time. Awesome. And uh, so before we go on to uh, talk about more of maybe like field courses that you're going to be offering, um, talk about Garamis in, uh, in Iquitos and in, in Peru. Grammys have been around since the 70s. Um, they were brought to Iquitos into a fish farm. Uh, there was a fish breeder that had about 20 ponds of exotic species that he was breeding. Uh, Grammys, bettas, mollies, swordtails, uh, goldfish. Uh, and he was selling them in the pet trade there in Peru. Uh, unfortunately, he went bankrupt, walked away from his ponds, and during the flood season, during the rainy season, his ponds flooded, emptied into the river, and the only thing that survived were the Grammys, and they have survived by the billions. And we know the exact dude and the exact operation that... I, yeah, wow. they, exactly who it is, exactly where it is, Unfortunately, now that area is, is now all houses. It used to be out in the middle of nowhere. Now it's part of the city. Mm. Uh, it's, you know, I've been to the exact point that the Grammy entered into the river system. Uh, and and that, that, that spot is now part of the open sewage system in, in Iquitos. And that's the advantage that the Grammys have, is that they can survive in the open sewage systems where... There's no oxygen uh, because there's so much decomposition, but because they have the labyrinth organ, they have that accessory organ in their throat where they can breathe atmospheric air, um, they, they're the only things that survive there. So they survive there by literally by the billion. Yeah, I was going to say, and it's not just a matter of survival. They're not eking out an existence. Like they're thriving in the sewage they're, water. I, yes, and, we, and we, we've shown... Uh, I had a student work on this just last year that in the Amazon or any place that you have this um, pulse flood stages where it floods and it dries, breeding occurs during the flood stage. Mm -hmm. As the water goes into the, the forest, all that food becomes available. And so everybody's breeding at that time. Well, Grammys breed any time of the year. So you always have a breeding population every month of the year not just in high water but in low water so they're not only you know surviving their their breeding uh in times that no one else is breeding so they're they potentially can take over the area wow is there so the answer is probably gonna be no but is there any type of silver lining like garamis in sewage water thriving where no other fish will live are they are they helping to keep down like a nasty insect population or like are they are they knocking out mosquitoes like is there any silver lining to these guys whatsoever um they they probably do cut down on some mosquitoes but i don't think there's a silver lining to any of it okay i, I really don't are they are they just staying uh, to the sewage or like i guess so what, what's the negative impact then that these garamis are having well, no, they're they're staying in the sewage during the dry season, mm -hmm. but when the flood stage comes, they're dispersing out to the main part of the rivers. And so you find grommies um, all over the place. You find them both in the Itaya River, uh, which is on the, well, let's see, the, the northwest, northeast area of Iquitos. Then you find them in Rio Nanay, where discus are found right uh, and all all the canals and waterways in between and so they they have really dispersed all over the place and they're not just getting crushed by like oscars or tiger shovel nose or any of these other fish they just seem to be okay they're they're in fact they're uh they're in direct competition with about six different species for food mm, and then that fact that they've got that labyrinth organ is is kind of that one yep. extra leg up on the competition yep. interesting exactly are they like a powder blue garami? Like what? Like what kind of garami are they? You know, I have 
pictures of some that are bright blue. Uh, they are just the normal uh, blue okay. three spot drums. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that was uh, that, yeah. When you had said that there were just grammys just thriving in the in the sewage while I was down there, that was that was something super interesting. And you know, glad that uh, you you expanded on that a little bit. All right, so let's talk about uh, we've got some we've got some volunteer internship opportunities. I'm actually looking at the brochure still. Um, so kind of talk about that aspect. So, hi, hi, Rowan. That's my yeah. That's my son bursting in on this interview. We'll see, we'll see if I leave that in or not. Hi, buddy. I don't, I don't know. Maybe listeners will get a kick out of that. Maybe I'll leave that in here. Well, it shows the, the human side of it. <laughs> All right. So, talk about is really what the research center is there for. That's not something we've really uh, touched on yet. Uh, you know, in the origins of why we actually had the research center. Yeah. Please expand. Yeah. So, the, you know, the research center has been set up as a teaching tool for the local fishermen. There have been some scientific studies that have shown that there is overcollection in the rivers around Iquitos and the overcollection is greatly impacting the fish populations. Uh, so what we do is we bring in fishermen uh, from the surrounding villages, bring them to the facility and teach them how to undertake aquaculture for these aquarium fish species. And so what that does, it allows them to have one, a steady income all year long because they bring them into these ponds. We're teaching them how to build ponds, teaching them how to take care of the fish, how to breed the fish. So they have a steady income all year long. So, it, you know, they don't have to go out and do other destructive practices, cutting down the trees and things for their firewood. Um, but it also makes them less reliant on wild caught fish. Uh, there are some fish that you just can't find anymore in Iquitos because they were overfished. And, and so by teaching the fishermen how to do this, it, it will help conserve and preserve some of their resources that they have. And so that was the main emphasis of the research center. Uh, you know, we're, we're not charging the fishermen to come here. It's, we're teaching them all free. We're, we, you know, we, we're a resource for them to utilize. Uh, and so that if they do have problems, let's say they have an outbreak of disease, we're there to help them through that problem. What to do, you know, to overcome their disease problems. What to do if the fish aren't eating enough, or uh, things of that sort. So we're we're there as a, um, you know, as a teaching tool for the fishermen in the area. Well, are is the uh, is the discus and that the local angel are those kind of like two staples of, uh, you know, I, I guess if I was a fisherman, I show up. And, or let's say I wasn't even a fisherman. I'm just somebody that I've heard that this is a way that I can make a sustainable living. I don't want to destroy my environment. I'm, I'm going to grow these fish that people around the world in Germany and America and Japan go absolutely crazy for. And they're just local fish in my water. What, what are you recommending to me? Well, the, the fish that we primarily work with with the fishermen because it brings them the most money are epistogrammas. Um, epistogrammas are so easy to breed in ponds it, it uh, it's unbelievable how fast reproduction occurs when they're in the ponds in a pond that's you know six by six maybe three feet deep you can produce three four hundred sellable epistogramma per month wow so yeah they they grow very quickly when they're in their natural conditions um you know, discus is another thing. Discus don't do very well in ponds. Uh, they tend to need uh, flowing water going through their system. Uh, when they have standing water, they're, they tend to be very prone to uh, diseases. And so most of the pond-raised discus are going to be very skinny. Uh, they're not going to be the best quality. And little do people know that discus in Rio Nanai are an invasive species. They don't belong there. Is this, so, is this a story where, like, a plane crashed carrying discus or something like that? Is that the one? There's two uh, There's two introductions of discus in Rio Nanai. Um, one is uh, a fish farmer had his, uh, his facility flooded. It released a bunch of discus from, um, from Manaus into Rio Nanai. And then the, uh, the other was the plane crash. 
not really a plane crash, but a plane ran out of gas <laughs> as they were transporting uh, discus. They went down to uh, Lake Tefe, and that's how the red spotted greens got into uh, into Rio Nanai and brought fish in from Manaus and Lake Tefe, supposedly about 10,000 fish, uh, and ran out of gas. And so they dumped their entire load of discus into the Rio Nanai. Wow. And see, that's, so, see, that's like that invasive manatee. Like nobody's going to be mad yeah. if all of a sudden you got a bunch of discus. Like that seems like a win. So, so, so because Lake Tefe is not producing red spotted greens anymore. Uh, they were overfished and outfished. Um, people want the red spotted greens from Peru. And so you, you find them occasionally on, on the exporters list for up to a hundred dollars each. So what, what do I have? I probably have just the standard Browns, right? You no, know, you probably have the standard green. Oh, green. Yeah, greens in there. Blues. It just depends on whose taxonomic system you want to use. Mm. You know, some people say there's no difference between greens and blues. Other people say there is. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm, I'm beefing myself up on my discus knowledge. I read your uh, your distribution paper that I think you wrote like a decade ago, but I've also yeah. I picked up a couple yeah. of you know cichlid cichlid nerd uh, Dick Owl yeah. uh, discus books, and so a, a part of this whole like fish room transformation is just really really trying to take myself down the discus rabbit hole and uh, really understanding what's going on there. Uh, which it sounds like again, you know, kind of to your point, it's like this big mass of confusion. Like you've got the yeah. you've got the discus genus that's been erected, but then you've got a few, you know, you've got a few species within that, and then there's like a kind of a quasi species in there, and people disagree, and yeah, it's all nonsense. So, <laughs> but I, I have every discus book ever published, so nice. I, yeah, I'm a discus nerd too. Oh, so. I love it. Yeah, good times. So uh, let's see here. Where are we? Where are we? Okay. Um, no, that's awesome. And then as far as, um, a piss, okay. So then as far as like, um, so yeah, teaching, teaching the locals to be able to kind of set up their aquaculture for, um, export for the export ornamental fish market. Um, what about like students and whatnot? Like, is it, is it specific academic students? Is it somebody like, let's say there's a 45 year old plumber from Dayton, Ohio, um, you know, he's passed his college years. He doesn't want to do that, but he's very interested in coming down to take a course. So he's not enrolled in an institution, but he could, could this plumber from Ohio come down and take your course or, oh, or... Yeah. so, you know, uh, you'd mentioned earlier uh, from the flyer internships and courses, uh, we're going to have an internship program where people who are interested in the aquarium hobby, uh, come down for at least two weeks. So that's the two week minimum for an internship and work in the public aquarium, work behind the scenes, maintaining the tanks. Uh, if they are Spanish speakers, uh, they can be, uh, you know, some of the um, the tour tour guides that are in the aquarium itself, telling people about the aquarium, about the species there. Um, there are opportunities for people to uh, come and take classes. Um, you know, just learn about the ecosystem there, not not a traditional um, college class where you're going to take tests and everything. It's uh, classes that are open to anybody, um, you know, from 18 to 82. If you want to learn about the fish that are there, uh, you want to see where the fish come from, learn about their natural history. Uh, we will collect fish. We, we have permits that allow us to collect, you know, certain number of fish so we don't wipe out the fish species. And, you know, that's something we, really stand for is not over collection you know there will be opportunities for people to possibly send fish back you know if they have an import permit so there, there's a, a lot of opportunities for people who are just interested in fish in general do, interested in the query do you have a more detailed course syllabus for the the two sessions for summer 2020 oh uh, we don't yet uh, we're we will get that all uh ready uh after the new year's uh once we know uh, the stages that the aquarium will be at. Um, you, if you do do an internship, uh, you're only responsible for your travel costs to and from Iquitos. You will be living in the dorms free of charge. Oh, nice. Uh, we're going to work you to death, but free <laughs> of charge. And then we'll have, we have a, a common kitchen area that you saw that was not really finished. Now it's finished. So we have a common kitchen area where, you know, we'll provide food and probably have a cook, uh, cook for everybody. And, you know, 
everybody take equal part of, of doing all the work. And and we one of the nice things is we have hot water. Um, we have toilets that flush. So we have a modern septic system where you can flush toilet paper down. I don't mean to be get into the graphicness of 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 a uh, toiletry, but uh, in most South American countries, you do don't you do not put your toilet paper in the toilet. You put them in a trash can. Uh, I never found that very comfortable doing that, but you know the pipes won't allow that. So I made sure we had modern plumbing system with a modern septic system. Uh, we have a washer and dryer on site, so you know it's kind of hard to dry things in a hundred percent humidity. Uh, they just don't want to dry. So you know we have modern amenities there for people, um, so they can live rustically. We can build you a hammock outside. You can <laughs> the mosquitoes, but I prefer to be inside of a room with air conditioning. And yeah, lights. I don't. I don't. I don't recommend uh, having now spent uh, a week down there. I don't recommend that uh, people do that. But uh, yeah, I, it, well, so what's funny is uh, you said that you watched the unboxing, right? The our Peru fish unboxing oh, yeah. yeah so yeah. i i saw myself in there i'm like i'm scratching my legs and i'm like i'm scratching yeah. my legs because i still had so many bug bites coming back yeah. <laughs> you just don't realize uh you oh, know you, and one of the worst for me is there's a little chigger mm -hmm. uh well in the south will know what that is these little tiny insects like a, that, no, like a no -seum, right or is yeah, it yeah, yeah. They're, they're usually are in the grass and they get into your ankles and they burrow into your ankles and they will itch for weeks and so that's the that's the insect that i don't like mosquitoes don't bother me very much I my think... wife's a mosquito magnet they they come near me and they they don't like my smell and they go away but the chiggers are always there one night uh, one night we went out i shared this uh, when i talked to i think when i was talking to neil but um uh, so some audience people know this but one night we went out uh, night collecting so we're in the we're in the little smaller skiff or whatnot we've got our headlamps and flashlights and we're you know looking for any fish up at the surface and i um you know i thought i was going to be cool like our tour leader and i wasn't going to wear shoes and i was just going to wear shorts you know it's yep. a warm night too and you know stupid randy like i'm a mosquito magnet too and so they're just crushing my legs they're crushing my feet like i'm swatting i'm not even enjoying it like it's miserable it is a miserable time even though we're having fun it's a beautiful evening and I, I then like get this idea. I'm like, oh my God, this is going to save me. And so I take one of our collecting buckets, um, fill it with water as much as I could, brought it back into the boat and put my feet. So I was able to submerge my feet all the way up to my knees and then pull my shorts down enough so that like I only had maybe a centimeter of, of knee flesh exposed. And that saved me because they were just, just yeah, destroying they... my feet. It was terrible. Stupidest thing I did on that trip. Easily, the stupid. Yeah. I did a lot of stupid things. That was the stupidest one. Uh, yeah, like that was so bad. Worse than worse than my GoPro falling off my head as I was surfacing in the water, uh, which I was able to go back down and find it. So, well, I lost the GoPro there. Yeah, that off was. My, didn't realize it came off my head until half hour later. So, <laughs> You're like, this is gonna be some great footage. Yeah, I don't know. You're like, this is going to be amazing footage. Yeah, and then yeah. It, it, so you know, I, I guess some other aspects of people coming down there, like just going into Iquitos itself, and you know, I don't want people to have a bad impression of it. I love Iquitos. I absolutely love my time in Iquitos. I can't wait to go back there. I can't wait to go back and have my boys be old enough. Which you know, if I left it in, people heard my boy come into this room, a little three year old. Like, I can't wait to take them down there to experience Iquitos because for me, it was almost this. It was it was Spanish speaking, Latin American mix of. Um, uh, my time in the Azores, so where my wife's family is from, the Portuguese islands, and, and what I'm what I'm getting at is, you know, the evening, like the evening starts very late, and families are out. Like in all these central plazas they have, families are out, little kids are out playing, and nobody gave off this like tough guy vibe. Nobody was giving off this vibe of like, you know, not having a good time. Which sometimes in the states you run into that. You run into people that are just like they're out and about and they're looking for trouble. Like I didn't get any of that whatsoever down there it was just a bunch of family and kids and you know people selling popcorn and silly light up toys and i loved it and that's like what every night was like at these little central plaza parks 
Uh, I thought it was fantastic. Like I loved being down there. I loved the, the the people that were all super friendly. The food was delicious. So that cylinder chicken that that you know I was dropping my my espanol on that was delicious. You and I we went out and had that amazing dinner. Uh, you know I picked up the tab and it was like ten bucks U.S. and it was amazing, right? Like I'm not even bragging, but it was just an amazing dinner for two people. Uh, and you know ten dollars U.S. is not too bad. And then we went out and. We went and, you know, had a sat out by the little boardwalk where all the people, again, kind of a, a, a main drag for people walking and, you know, families out having a good time, young couples out hanging out with each other and uh, Michael Jackson impersonators. And it was just it was just such a cool experience aside from the fish nerd stuff. Like it was just a great, great travel experience that, you know, if somebody was looking to maybe they don't want to go out on a boat for seven days. Maybe they don't want to dedicate an entire trip of just, you know, doing, um, you know, being way out in the Amazon and, and, you know, what the what the research center offers is more in line with what you would like to do. Be closer to the city of Iquitos. I don't I don't know. Like, I think it's yet one more option. And I think it's it was such a cool experience of going to uh, going to Iquitos, doing that, being down there. And I can't for me, I can't wait to go back. Well, you you always have a. A place to stay, and but when when you do go down there, make sure you let me know, so I won't be there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice, nice. Well, if I'm not there, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull some tricks or something. I'll uh, I'll leave some I'll leave some some jokes behind or, or whatnot for you. <laughs> so you'll you'll want to make sure that you're there if I'm there. Yeah. All the Carlos will keep an eye on me, right? Yeah, he will. If I act up, he'll throw me in the giant pond. Yeah, with our with our alligators that we have. Oh, nice! There you go. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Your caiman, right? Yeah, our our black caiman. All right, Anthony. Well, it sounds like uh, you know. I mean, thank you very much for the uh, for taking the time out this evening to talk to me. I mean, you know, I'm I'm so upset and sad that the first our first conversation our first interview you know the the recording went sideways but you know to be able to connect with you again kind of go down some different avenues of, of conversation i think this you know if people don't like this they can go kick rocks and go find another fish podcast to listen to this is this is a fantastic conversation with you and i hope people are uh you know truly excited about the work that you're doing um you know of, of creating this amazon research center for ornamental fishes and just the good that you're trying to do from it and i hope I hope they support it. I mean, I, I am going to support you financially. I want to support you uh, with what I can with this podcast platform to spread the word. You know, let's give it another six months. We'll have you back on again and, and keep the research center fresh in people's minds. And I'll give you, I will give you all that free publicity that you want. That's no problem. You just need to share some fish nerd knowledge with me to, to keep the, the listeners engaged. And hey, you've got a platform with me, man. I appreciate that. And then, really and then we'll see each other in what two weeks? We'll see each other in less than two weeks in China. We'll see each other in China. <laughs> I don't think I have never said that before to anybody <laughs> in my life. <laughs> hey, I'll see you. See you in Shanghai, Bob. Right. <laughs> All right, Doctor Anthony Maserol. Fantastic conversation, man. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Randy, for for all your help.